Danny speak, um, what he has to say will speak for itself. Obviously, we're looking at inclusion, we're looking at transitions, we're looking at equity and equality. So lots of issues there. Danny, as it says, is honorary fellow at the University of Edinburgh. He's uh, an internationally renowned as well as very uh, well read in terms of Scottish education. He'll be up for questions at the end, I'm sure, so do try when he presents to, to think of questions you may ask him at the end. And basically just enjoy it. It's good for thought today. It's, it's based around Scottish education, but I'm sure you'll get a lot from it. So thank you very much, Danny. to the billing. Uh, what I want to do this morning is to give you some information about inclusion in Scotland, uh, not just now but also the story of how we got to where we are now and the challenges that people say are facing us now in Scotland and leave you with some questions really about some of the issues involved because inclusion is not an easy thing to understand and many people have many different views of what it involves. So it's political as well as educational. So, first of all, I just want to say a few words about this. Before the 1970s, maybe 40, 50 years ago, by and large, education in Scotland was based on specialised provision. So if you had a hearing impairment, you went to a school for deaf people. If you had a visual impairment, you went to a school for blind people. If you had emotional issues in your life that reflected in behavioural problems, you were behaving in antisocial ways, then you were sent away to a residential school for children who didn't behave well. So the different categories of need were often separated into different types of school. And um, this was true also of looked after children. Um, very often there were charitable schools that had been set up in the 1800s, the 19th century, by the church or other foundations. And looked after children, many of them were looked after in residential accommodation in these places rather than with families. Um, so that was a very different pattern, and there was also a different pattern in Scotland in relation to every child, because up until 1965, is there any light here, unfortunately? There's not one. Up until 1965, children in Scotland sat an examination at age 11 or 12 <coughs> that decided which kind of school they would go to, either to a school for those who wanted to or had the, as it was said at the time, had the potential to study academically and perhaps go on eventually to university study. And then everybody else who went to a different kind of school where it was deemed that they could leave school early and go into work. So there were those two levels of schooling. And children who went to the senior, what were called the senior secondary schools, this was one of them. By the way, I went to one as well because I'm of that age, and I was at school in those days. Um, and then all the rest of the children went to a different school. So that was a separated, specialised system too. But from 1965, Scotland introduced comprehensive secondary schools. There was no test. And every child in a local area was supposed to go to that school. So I suppose I'm just describing a change in people's attitudes. Over time, people's attitudes changed and developed. And that was true also of thinking about children who previously had gone to specialised provision, like a deaf school, or a school for children with cerebral palsy, or a school for children with hearing impairments, or these other kind of problems. Um, and there were a lot of people in Scotland in the 60s, 70s and 80s advocating what was called mainstreaming that every child, irrespective of need, if they were in a wheelchair, if they couldn't see, if they couldn't hear, if their behaviour was difficult, whatever the issue for that child, they were still, many people said, <coughs> entitled to come to their own local school. And these advocates of this new philosophy 
gained ground in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Um, and there were a lot of indications of that. Um, so, for example, these acts and reports I mentioned here are an example of that. People in the country as a whole, whereas before they had thought, well, you're a deaf child, you should go to a deaf school for deaf children. Now more and more people in the country began to think, no, these children should be in with every other child. So that's a change in society and people's thinking uh, more generally, not just among the teachers, but more generally people began to think it is their right to be in their own local school, not to have to go to somewhere else where the only people they meet are people with their particular issue. And also it was felt, quite importantly, that for the children that didn't have a special, special need, the children that didn't need those kinds of special provision, those children also should meet these children, that their lives would be better, their education would be better, if they were meeting children who had to go around in a wheelchair, children who had to cope with poor sight, children who had these kind of difficulties which previously had been in a way hidden, kept somewhere else so that children didn't see, most children didn't see these children and how they coped with the issues they had to face. So this became I would say the kind of orthodoxy in the universities where the teachers were being trained but the teachers themselves were not always so enthusiastic because Actually, it can be quite difficult to educate lots of different children with different needs in the same school. Um, so, if you're interested, I said to Sue that perhaps this, if some of you are interested, we could make the links, I put a lot of links in this talk, um, to other sources of information. So, Lani Florian, who's a professor at the University of Edinburgh here, um, she is a powerful advocate of what she calls inclusive pedagogy. That teachers should be able to teach in such a way that any child can participate in the learning in their classroom. And there's a professor of childhood inclusion, which actually is right exactly on this subject at the University of Edinburgh, this chap John Davis. So these links take you to a lecture that these uh, professors gave about these issues, and if any of you want to follow it up, uh, you can do so there. <coughs> However, despite successes in including more children in schools in Scotland, there were a lot of studies took place uh, which showed <coughs> that pupils reintegrated into the mainstream were not succeeding. So, uh, for example, I've got a quote here I want to read to you. Oh, I don't have the quote. <laughs> <laughs> I printed out the previous version. Okay, forget that. Now, how am I going to make that link? Um, I'll do that in a second. Um, <coughs> there were many studies. I mean, this woman, uh, Mary MacDonald, uh, is one of them. At the bottom there is a quote I was going to give you. She was a teacher of children with additional support needs. And she did her study for her master's thesis on schools in Edinburgh and the extent to which these children were being included or not. And what she found was that in many cases, these children were being physically included in the school. They were in the building, but they didn't feel included. And they didn't feel they were being supported. And they didn't feel that the lessons they were receiving addressed their needs. So the education authorities, the politicians, they could say, we are now including these children, but the children didn't feel included. They felt, in fact, that their separation was even more because they were in the same school, but they couldn't participate in the same way. They couldn't take part in the same way. The average cost for a child in a mainstream secondary school in Scotland is, let's say, I haven't looked up the recent figures, but it will be about £6,500 a year, 
£7,000 a year or something like that. But in a residential school, the cost for a child would be 30, 40, maybe even 50,000 pounds a year. And so if local authorities didn't have to send <coughs> the child with hearing impairment to a residential school, or even a day school that had special provision, then they were saving a lot of money. And that was also true of the children who were not behaving well. Children who, for example, had committed crimes in the community. Previously, these children were sent to a kind of children's school that was like a kind of prison, if you like, because it was a residential school. And the cost of that was very expensive. Um, whereas if you brought these children back into the community, then you could send them to the local school. It wasn't going to cost you so much. So many teachers said, wait a minute, the resources you did save, we should be getting those resources so we can spend those resources in the school. But of course that is not what happened. Uh, what happened was money was saved. So these were some of the tensions. And mainstream teachers themselves were, and some of them still are, I would say, unenthusiastic. The link there takes you to an article by a teacher who describes himself as the secret teacher. And he writes in one of the British newspapers occasionally, Teachers in this country are not allowed to speak in public and criticise their employer. So you cannot, as a teacher in a Scottish school, go into even a public forum like this, although many teachers actually do say things <laughs> in schools, um, but you couldn't, for example, or you shouldn't, for example, go and speak to parents and say, this is ridiculous, this city, Edinburgh, doesn't spend enough because you are an officer of the council. You're not allowed to criticise the council. You're not allowed to speak against the council. So this teacher calls himself the secret teacher uh, because he doesn't reveal his name, but he writes in the newspapers about the problems that he faces as a teacher. So he is actually very sympathetic to inclusion. He likes the idea of inclusion, but he says the reality is not so good. Why? Because there's not enough money spent in the school to support inclusion, to make it possible to work. Okay? So I'm going to stop there and ask you, how is that? Are you understanding me okay? Yeah. Is it okay for you? Yeah. Very good. Okay, so this in the year 2000 was a new piece of legislation, a new law for Scotland called the Standards in Scotland School Act. And it pulled together all these little bits and pieces of things that have been happening with mainstreaming every child. And this clause of, this is the actual act of Parliament that put this into law. <coughs> And there were several things in the Act. But this clause, number 15, this was the one that was really important for inclusion. Because what this said is that we presume that every child is going to be educated in the mainstream school. The, what they call the presumption of mainstreaming. That every child should be educated in a mainstream school. And this is the clause 15. You see, where an education authority, like the City of Edinburgh, for example, runs the schools, and there are 32 of these authorities in Scotland, the City of Glasgow, and so on. I come from Stirling, another part of Scotland. Um, where an education authority, in carrying out their duty to provide school education to a child of school age, local authorities have that requirement in Scotland, where they provide that education in a school, <coughs> they shall, unless one of the circumstances mentioned below arises in relation to the child, and there are only three exceptions, they shall provide it in a school other than a special school. And it shall be presumed those circumstances arise only exceptionally. So if you are a counsellor, one of the local authority, or if you are a, an officer of the local authority, the Scottish Government and the law in Scotland now assumes that you will try to make available 
for every single child, no matter what their needs, a place in a mainstream school. So that's now the law. And they give three categories of exception. But these three categories of exception are actually quite broad. Here are the three exceptions. One, the place you're going to put the child in would not suit the ability or aptitude of the child. Well, that's, you could argue that that could be the case for any child. Then, would be incompatible, not fit with the provision of efficient education for the children with whom the child would be educated. In other words, the impact of putting this child in the school would affect the other children and they would not be able to learn so well. And of course that is a common argument among teachers. If a new child arrives at the school and they have to spend so much time with that child, they're not spending time with the other children because that child has very many special needs. And the third exception would result in unreasonable expenditure or cost. So it would cost too much. So the Act actually left three what we call loopholes, three spaces that people could argue and get out of the mainstreaming idea. And really since the year 2000, a lot of the arguments in Scotland have been around that. Because say for example, a parent wants their child put into the local school, but the child is in a wheelchair. And because the child is in a wheelchair, and this is an old school that has lots of stairs and no lift, the local authority now has to spend money to put a lift so the child can be lifted from one floor to the next floor. Or maybe ramps to allow the wheelchair to go up and down. So it costs the local authority money. So the parent says, we want our child to go into that school. The local authority says, we have no money this year, we'll maybe try it next year. Then there are arguments that the parent can take the local authority to the court. <coughs> Various things happen like that. But it can happen the other way around too. It can happen that a local authority says, your child should go to Trinity Academy. But the parent says, I don't think Trinity Academy is suitable for my child. It's too big, it's too noisy. My child will find the corridors too difficult to cope with. Um, so... I want my child to go to a special school where they'll get special support. So, although the law said this, there was still a lot of room for parents and local authorities to argue about what is the best place for my child? What is the best place for my child to grow and develop and be educated? So, I think we're still in the same position in Scotland. We've got lots of laws, new laws. We've got lots of new advice. This is the most important one, the Additional Support for Learning Act. And <coughs> basically the philosophy there was every child needs support for their learning at some time. You know, all of you will need extra support at some time compared to what everybody else gets. You might need that wee bit of additional support just for a short time, say somebody important in your life dies, maybe a grandparent or an uncle or a parent, and you're grieving, you're hurt, you're sore, you can't learn. Well, you need a wee bit of extra support and attention. It may be the only thing you need in your whole school career, additional. But everybody will need something additional. But some children need something additional all the time. And some children need something additional that's exceptional because of their needs. So that term, additional support, came into the Scottish vocabulary because of that new act. What the link took you to was a, a site in the Scottish Government's education internet site. There's a site called Parent Zone, which is specifically information for parents. So if you're a parent of a child with additional needs, <coughs> it tells you there what categories of additional needs are recognized as very specific, like hearing impairment or visual impairment or 
uh, ADHD or whatever. I'm sure you covered a few of these this morning. Um, and then you can look up on that site what kinds of things you can expect your education authority to do for your child, either in a mainstream school or in a special school. And there still are special schools, and there's still a mix of provision. Um, and there's formal processes, like the record of needs, the record of future needs. Have you used some of these terms? Not yet. Um, so there are formal processes by which children's needs are put into writing. Because one of the problems with putting things into law is that people can then disagree. Is the law being fulfilled? And then it goes to the courts and a judge has to decide who's right, the parent or the local authority that's providing the school. So there have been conflicts between parents that have gone to the level of going to court because it's a dispute. And then it becomes quite important who assessed the child, who determined that child had these needs, and what specifically are the needs. Because if you don't know what the needs are, you don't know whether they're being met. So this then becomes a legal process which, and as you maybe know, once you take things into the law, then you've got somebody arguing one side and somebody arguing the other side, and it becomes an argument. But it seems to be necessary because that's what the law says. So the record of needs is a place where it's written down. This is what this child needs. And many children with additional support needs have that record of needs. And that puts it into really clear words. This is what this child needs in their education. Now it's assumed that most children don't need a record. But actually what's happened since the year 2000 is that more and more children in Scotland have now got a record. Because the, the thing is, I used to be a school principal in different schools. And when you're a school principal, you're always trying to get more resources for your school. You want to have more teachers. You want to have more support for the children that need it. So you quickly discover as a school principal that you won't get more resources unless you've got a record of needs for the child. Because if the child doesn't have a record of needs, the local authority says, well, we're not going to give you any more money because they don't have a record of needs. So they just, just deal with them. But, you know, get on with it. So often the parents in the past didn't want their child to have a record of needs because they said, that labels my child, that makes my child different. So you can now point to them and say, you've got a record of needs. I want my child to be the same as other children. I don't want them to have a special record. But in the meantime, the head teacher on the other side, the principal, is saying, no, I want the child to have a record of needs because... Uh, if they have a record of needs, I can go to the local authority and say, I need more money, I need an additional teacher, I need some help to respond to this child's needs. So we've got other, there's many of these little acronyms for the little initials stand for words. So individual education plans, coordinated support plans. All these kind of things are part of the bureaucracy now of needs because everything has to be written down and assessed. To add to all that, to add to all that, the government also introduced this thing, GERFIC, which stands for Getting It Right for Every Child. Okay, getting it right for every child. So every teacher in Scotland now knows GERFIC. And there's a lovely diagram illustrating GERFIC, which we could get to on that link, and maybe later on you might print it out and give it to the group if they can't link to it. Um, but it says that all children should be safe, they should be respected, a whole range of things. And the last one of these... Is it the last? Yeah, that's the last one. Is included. They need to be included. So.
So Gerthek takes things beyond education, school education, because this is about school education. But Gerthek is about the whole child and their whole experience, not just in school, but outside of school. Their health, their family environment. And under Gerthek, the Scottish government wanted to introduce, and has in fact introduced into law, although not yet into practice, that every child in a Scottish school should have a named person, a professional person in the school who takes a special interest in and speaks for that child. This has led to a lot of argument in Scotland because many parents don't want a person in the school kind of playing the role of a parent. And they see potential conflicts between the parent's role as parent and the named person's role, whose job is to look out for the child. Suppose the named person were to say, those parents aren't doing enough for that child, and start criticising the parents. Well, then the parents would become very anxious and upset. And so the named person thing is now quite controversial in Scotland, and the government has received a lot of criticism for it. Um, it's said that the government is interfering too much in family life. They're poking their nose in where it isn't wanted. And the government says, no, we're trying to make sure that every child in Scotland has a good start in life. So these kind of conflicts are there just now, right, very current actually, very current, and are being discussed <coughs> in the Scottish Parliament. I don't know if you'll meet an MSP today, but if you do, you might want to ask them about named person legislation. Depending upon whether they're in the ruling party or the other parties, they might give you different answers. Oh, here's another thing. 2010, we got the Scottish Equality Act. So this is another one that's quite important for school. Oh, well, I'll do this first. Um, so with regard to needs, most local authorities in Scotland now have what they call staged intervention. Okay, you have a need. Like I mentioned, maybe you've had a bereavement in your family and you're very upset and find it difficult to learn because somebody very close to you has passed away, has died. So... Usually that would be what's called universal. The school should find a way of helping with that. There's pastoral staff, there's other people in the school can help me. Then this is about different levels of need. And as you go up the levels, the needs increase. The amount of support required increases. So if you're at stage three, this is what you need a lot of support. Maybe involving several different agencies, health, social work other agencies outside the school. And these typically would have a record of needs, people at this stage. So that's what I mean about a bureaucracy of support. Teachers have to keep records of all these things. They have to do assess written assessments. The written assessments have to be updated. There have to be meetings every year to review has the child's needs been met. These meetings need to be minuted. So you end up, for each child, with a big folder of paperwork. And people become very defensive. Because as a head teacher or a school principal, you might end up in court with a judge and a lawyer saying, this is what it says in the document and you've not done it. So what I mean by defensive is that you don't want to write down anything you know you can't do. You know, you want to be very careful and protect what's possible. These are the protected characteristics. Schools cannot and should not, under the law in Scotland, discriminate, treat differently. Anybody in these kind of categories, you shouldn't treat people differently because of their age, <coughs> their ability or disability, gender reassignment, marriage, pregnancy, race, religion, belief, sex, sexual orientation. And... Not only that, but schools have to advance equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. So schools have a responsibility 
to make sure that people in these different categories get the same treatment as anybody else in a favoured category. So in Scotland, the favoured category would usually be white male. Okay, that would be the most favoured category usually. But additionally, another layer over that, which has got a lot of discussion going in Scotland at the moment, is social class. And to simplify that a bit, basically we're talking about the spectrum in society from the rich to the poorest. So a lot of people would argue that white males in the poorest section of society are actually very, very disadvantaged. More disadvantaged than white females in the poorest section of society. So this is a difficult territory, the territory of protective characteristics. Who is normal? You know, who is the main category that everybody else has to be compared to? This is difficult political and social territory. Now, that was all the background to the laws and all the rest of it. But we've actually got some, on the back of that, we have some great things happening in Scottish schools now. And um, I've given links here to many of these. There's all kinds of interesting things going on out there. Ways that local authorities and schools are reaching out to families in difficulty. Um, children who are in care who aren't in their own family for whatever reason. Maybe they're adopted or maybe they're fostered out to another family because of problems in their own family. Or maybe they're in residential care. They're what we call looked after children in Scotland, the LAC, looked after children. When these children reach the end of school, they're facing a big, difficult adult world. And this is one of the big challenges of transition and I know you're talking about transition a great deal in this visit. It's all very well for schools to give support. Schools are quite protected spaces, they're quite safe spaces. And in law, schools have to give support. But what happens when the support is not there? What happens when you go out into adult society and there is no support? So, Care leavers, these young people who are in care, there used to be, they talked about falling off a cliff. They'd gone along in school with support, and then it's like there's a cliff and they fall because there's no support. So now there's a lot of work in Scotland around supporting these youngsters after they leave school. <coughs> and in fact, they should be supported until age 25 if they are children who have been in care. There, there should be a plan for them, taken over by the social work department, not by the school, from age 18 to age 25, to provide continuing support for looked after children after they leave formal education. So lots of things happening in Scotland, lots of advice to schools, so many documents, you know, as a school principal, I could put all these documents one on top of the other on my desk, I would have a massive number of documents, nods from the side of the room. And we used to say Scotland has world-class guidance <laughs> for teachers as to what they should do. If you read all that guidance, you would think there's, there can be no problems in Scottish schools. Everything is so good. But actually, it's one thing to guide and advise. Another thing to say, yes, that's really good, and a much more difficult thing to make it work in practice. So the difference between policy and practice is <coughs> still quite big. And we're still at it. Here we are, only very recently, in fact last week, that's how recent it is, and that's what I added this morning to my slides, um, last week, there were amendments to the 2004 Additional Support for Learning Act, which gave rights to children from the age of 12 to have their voices heard in terms of their needs and whether they're being met. So these are the new rights that children now have in secondary schools, the right to ask the school if they need extra support. <coughs> 
the right to have a say in plans, and already most schools have been giving them a say in their plans. To get advocacy help, somebody to help them to make their case, and to ensure that their views are taken on board, and to receive legal representation, to have a lawyer who can speak for them in the formal processes, and to be involved in resolving disagreements. <coughs> so this is very good, of course, to involve the young people themselves in the discussions about their future. But it's going to be difficult to implement in practice. I mean, suppose, for example, we've now introduced a third voice. So before we had the local authority, and we had the parent, and now we have the child. Suppose the child disagrees with the parent, and both of them disagree with the local authority. So it's good that the children are being given these additional rights, but it adds to the political complexity of these decisions. So I put a lot of links up there to um, more successes. <coughs> and one of these, this is a lovely little link uh, on a girl called Ella. I was trying to get a program for you that was broadcast on the British television last year about this issue, inclusion. But I couldn't get a hold of it. I tried various people to get a hold of the program. I couldn't get a hold of it. But there are little extracts from that program. And we won't be able to use them just now, but I hope you can find them um, and use them. Because this is a little girl who's just come into first year in a secondary school in Scotland. She's in a wheelchair. And she's, she's a Glasgow girl. She's got a Glasgow accent. She speaks like people from Glasgow. who speak very differently from people from Edinburgh. We do. She's got, <laughs> and the Glasgow accent is a lovely accent. It's very musical, uh, the tones they go up and down. So this little girl is talking about her experience of being in a busy secondary school in a wheelchair. It's very, very positive. Very, very positive. Good image for Scottish schools. And there are many examples of that in our Scottish schools now, which, remember, I started in the 1960s. In those days... That wouldn't have happened. It would not have happened. But training now have to be judged against this framework for inclusion, which talks about the values and beliefs <coughs> Scottish teachers are meant to have. You're supposed to believe in every child and be ready to support every child. Um, you're supposed to develop the skills and abilities to support a range of children. And remember I said before, not every teacher though is entirely happy with that. They point, for example, to the medical profession. In the UK and in Scotland, if, you're, if you have a basic kind of problem with your health, you go to what's called a general practitioner. That's a doctor who deals with most everyday things. But if you have something specific wrong with you, wrong with your heart, wrong with... Uh, your lungs, you know, then you would go to a specialist because there are specialist doctors deal with those special things. So many teachers say, well, why do you expect ordinary teachers to have the knowledge to cope with extraordinary things? You know, we can't have all the knowledge to deal with children who are deaf, who are blind, who are disabled, who have cerebral palsy, all these special needs needs special support. So, that argument still goes on. Nonetheless, there are many schools in Scotland now where teachers are well briefed by their support staff in the school about the needs of the children in that school. But we're never going to get, in my view, this is my view, we're never going to get to a point where every child is best dealt with in their mainstream school. And there are several reasons for that. This is two other children who you maybe see later on talking about their experience in secondary schools. Gavin is a boy who can't communicate by speaking. He communicates with a computer. And the computer talks for him. So he's obviously quite a bright boy, a very intelligent boy. And he finds his experience of school very lonely. He feels isolated because no one is his friend. 
because they can only speak to him through the computer. And like you, you all look as if you're very fit and able, you like to move about quickly, get the chat, quick chat, quick repartee. It's very difficult to do that if you're a child who can only communicate with your computer. So he feels different because he's in a school with a lot of people that are different to him. And it's very moving to hear him talk about that. And the other child there, Abigail, she's a young woman in a secondary school who just doesn't like being seen as different. She wants to be seen as the same as everybody else, but in that school, because she's got a special need, she's seen as different. And she doesn't like that. She doesn't like being seen as different. And it upsets her emotionally. And there are many special schools in Scotland doing fantastic work. Really, if you were only to show a few examples, these would be the ones. This is a great school, Camp Hill in Aberdeen, that deals with children with various levels of need on a day basis and a residential basis. And it's obviously just a marvellous school. But all the children there have additional needs. It's a special school. And the children there are actually very happy to be there. And they're getting a level of support for their needs that I don't think they would get in a mainstream school. They're missing out on mainstream contact, but they're getting good educational support. And the yard, which is just down the road here, is a, a play centre in Edinburgh for children with additional needs. And it's a terrific centre for children playing together and being together that's special provision. So as soon as you say mainstream or special, <coughs> and mainstream is better, I don't think you can say that. Because often when you look at what special provision gives, it's often very, very good. And the third sector, that's not private schools and not state schools, but charities and other organisations like that, they have a very important role in coming up with new ideas and doing new things. And if you only rely on the state, you end up tending to get the same thing all the time and not enough difference. And the Scottish Parliament Committee that looks at education, the committee of our representatives in Parliament, where you're going this afternoon, I understand, they did an inquiry last year into additional support. And they said the policy to include is having the opposite effect to what was intended in some circumstances because of a lack of resources. In other words, we're including children in the schools, but we're not providing enough resources to support them. And that's partly because of the increase in schools that have uh, pupils that have recorded needs. In 2003, the figure was fewer than 1 in 20 children with a record of needs, and now it's almost a quarter. So that's the game teachers are playing to get children's needs recognised. They have to put them through the bureaucracy. Saying a child has additional support needs doesn't mean that child is getting additional support. So this is 2018, this quote. This is exactly where we are in Scotland. We have the rhetoric, we have the philosophy, we have the desire, the, we want to do this, but the problems still remain very big. So, I think that's partly because inclusion is such a slippery concept. It has many meanings. It means different things. It could be just physical inclusion, just put somebody in the building, but that's not inclusion, people would say. That's not including people. There's also social inclusion, like that boy I told you about who's in the building, but because he communicates with a computer, he doesn't feel he's included with his colleagues. He doesn't feel he's part of it. There's emotional inclusion, feeling included, and of course this is a characteristic for all young children and all people your age. It's no fun if everybody else is friends and you're not. You're on the outside. 
and everybody else's friends. But it's not just about what happens in schools. It's about how the society is. And when you're in the secondary school, when you're just 11 or 12, you're maybe just kind of about the place. But as you get up to 15, 16, 17, you can see what's ahead of you. You can see where you are going to fit into society. And you can see that people have different chances. And you can see if you're from a poor background and you've not succeeded in school, you've not passed all the exams, you can see that your chances are not going to be so good as many other people's chances. So I would argue again, education is not just about what happens in schools, it's about what happens in society as a whole. And because Britain is quite an unequal society, and because people in Britain very often move about in their own little boxes, they live in a certain area with people the same as them, they get into their car in the morning and they drive to work, and at work they're with people the same as them, they go out at the weekend with people the same as them, they don't meet a broad crest section of society, in school you do, because schools are inclusive. But out there in the adult world, not really so much. Most adults do not meet a cross-section of society. Most adults do not meet people with disabilities. Most adults do not meet people out with their own class on a regular basis. Unless they go to, say, a church, maybe some churches are more inclusive, or. If they go to hospital, hospitals are very inclusive because they've got lots of people from different cross-section of society. So society is not inclusive. Therefore, how could schools ever be completely inclusive? So I think we're missing a trick in our political debates in Scotland. And all of this, as I said to you, is political debate at the moment, a lot of discussion around these issues in politics. But when you say that the education of children with additional needs is the responsibility of the school, I say, no, you're mistaken. The whole society has a responsibility as to how we educate all our children. And if we want to educate all our children inclusively, then we need to look at how we include them in adult society and that means looking at issues that are to do with how our society is organised. Very quickly, I'm just coming to an end. Very quick. Um, there's a link here to a current... Actually, at the moment, we're talking about this in Scotland. We're talking about mainstreaming. I told you about the 2000 Act. The government's consulting on that just now. Again, you might raise this this afternoon. There is a consultation before a new law is passed or an amendment to the law is passed about the presumption of mainstreaming. That thing that was in the Act in 2000 has been argued about ever since, and they're trying to clarify it some more, so there's a new bit of legislation coming in Scotland on it. But I don't think it's about just schools. I think it's about living in a democracy. And I think it's about these important values of democracy. These are the old values of democracy going back hundreds of years. And many of you will recognise these. It's about equality, yes. But equality isn't the only value in democracy. We also value liberty or freedom for individuals to make choices. And these two values are always in tension. Sometimes you have to compromise on your free choice in the interests of equality. Sometimes you can't get equality because you're giving choice to people. So in Scotland, and I know in the Netherlands, I'm not so sure about Sweden or Germany, I suspect, yes. In Scotland, certainly, we have many private schools, particularly here in Edinburgh. And most of the children who attend private schools are from families who are very wealthy. And they pay lots of money for their children to attend these schools because these schools provide them with advantages in life. So that's not very equal, but it does represent some kind of liberty for people who have money and can choose. So that's what I mean by these values being in tension. We can't in society have all of one or all of the other. The only 
time that we've tried to impose equality was the Soviet communist experiment, and that broke down in the 1990s. So we're in, in tension, and different societies value different amounts of these different values. And something I think of what's important is captured by the word fraternity. If you take away the kind of male sense of it and just look at it in its meaning, fraternity is about being face to face with people and respecting them and living with them. And I think that's what we do in schools by and large. But as soon as you go beyond the school, that doesn't happen so much. And that's the big challenge for secondary schools because we have to prepare for what happens next. So, I think the challenges in schools reflect the challenges we have in democracy more generally. What kind of society do we want? Do we want a society where people are more equal? Do we want a society where everybody has the same opportunities? And how can that only be the responsibility of schools? Schools can only do so much. And then it's the responsibility of everyone in the society if we want proper inclusion. Okay, that's me.